This court, independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy. While the FBI is famous for doing all it takes to track down the worst criminals and serial killers and ensuring that justice is served, they are also known for being secretive about their investigations. They often release crucial details of their investigations long after these serial killers have been arrested. Sometimes these details remain hidden forever. In today's video, I will be uncovering six things the FBI keeps secret about these famous serial killers. Ted Bundy Ted Bundy's early life and upbringing played a significant role in shaping the man he would become. Born in 1946 in Burlington, Vermont, Bundy's childhood was marked by confusion and abuse. Raised by his grandparents, he believed his mother was his sister until he was five years old. This revelation had a profound impact on Bundy's sense of identity and would contribute to his troubled psyche. Bundy's grandfather was physically abusive, creating a hostile environment for the young boy. His mother eventually fled with him to Washington, where she married Johnny Bundy, who formally adopted Ted. Despite the change in environment, Bundy's childhood remained filled with conflicting accounts and emotional turmoil. Different versions of Bundy's early years were given to different people, adding to the mystery surrounding his upbringing. While he described himself as a loner with dark fantasies, many who knew him in high school remember him as well-liked and popular. This contrast in perceptions further highlights the complexity of Bundy's character. After graduating from high school, Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound before transferring to the University of Washington. It was during this time that he began dating Elizabeth Klopfer, who would later report him to the police as a suspect in the murders. Despite his outward charm and charisma, Bundy's dark tendencies were already beginning to manifest. Bundy's first known attack occurred on January 4th, 1974, when he assaulted Karen Sparks in her apartment. Bundy broke into her home while she was sleeping and brutally attacked her, leaving her in a coma. This incident marked the beginning of Bundy's descent into a series of murders that would terrorize the nation. Bundy's modus operandi evolved over time, becoming more organized and sophisticated. He would employ various ruses to lure his victims to the vicinity of his vehicle, where he had pre-positioned a weapon, often a crowbar. In many cases, Bundy would wear a plaster cast on one leg or a sling on one arm, pretending to be injured and requesting assistance in carrying something to his vehicle. Bundy's charm and charisma played a crucial role in his ability to deceive his victims and those around him. He would sometimes approach females pretending to be an authority figure or a firefighter, exploiting their trust and manipulating them into vulnerable situations. Bundy's outward charm masked the dark and twisted nature that lurked beneath the surface. Once Bundy had his victims within his grasp, he would subject them to unspeakable acts of violence. He engaged in acts of necrophilia and mutilation, displaying a disturbing fascination with the corpses of his victims. Bundy would often revisit the bodies, engaging in acts of post-mortem manipulation and desecration. Decapitation was another horrifying aspect of Bundy's crimes. He would sever the heads of some of his victims and keep them as trophies, a chilling testament to his depravity. These acts of violence and mutilation added an extra layer of horror to an already terrifying series of crimes. Bundy's ability to blend in and change his appearance made it difficult for witnesses to identify him. He would alter his facial hair or hairstyle as necessary, and he concealed a distinctive dark mole on his neck with turtleneck shirts and sweaters. Even his car, a Volkswagen Beetle, proved difficult to pin down, as witnesses described its color in various conflicting ways. In the end, Bundy's reign of terror came to a halt. After years of eluding capture, he was finally apprehended by law enforcement. Bundy's capture marked a turning point in the investigation, bringing a sense of relief to the communities he had terrorized. Bundy's trial was marked by his erratic behavior and refusal to cooperate with his lawyers. Despite his attempts to manipulate the legal system, he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death. Bundy spent years on death row, where he suffered abuse from other prisoners and fathered a child with his wife, Carol Ann Boone. On January 24, 1989, Bundy was executed by electric chair. His death was met with a mix of relief and closure for the victim's families and the public. The impact of Bundy's crimes on the victims' families cannot be overstated. Their lives were forever shattered by the loss of their loved ones, and the scars left by Bundy's actions will never fully heal. Ted Bundy's story serves as a chilling reminder of the evil that can lurk beneath a seemingly normal exterior. His charm and ability to deceive not only his victims, but also law enforcement and the media added an extra layer of complexity to his crimes. The secrets kept by the FBI about Bundy's case were done to protect the integrity of the investigation and ensure that justice could be served. John Wayne Gacy. 
John Wayne Gacy's dark and twisted journey into the realm of serial killing began long before his heinous crimes came to light. Born on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois, Gacy's childhood was marred by a troubled family life and an abusive father. Gacy's father, an alcoholic and a strict disciplinarian, subjected him to physical and emotional abuse, leaving deep scars on his psyche. This tumultuous upbringing would later play a significant role in shaping the monster he would become. As Gacy grew older, his troubled past manifested in a series of criminal behaviors. In 1968, he was convicted of sodomy, a crime that offered a glimpse into the darkness that lurked within him. However, little did anyone know that this was just the beginning of a horrifying descent into depravity. After serving his sentence, Gacy moved to Chicago and started a construction business called PDM Contractors. On the surface, he appeared to be a successful businessman and an active member of his community. But behind closed doors, a sinister transformation was taking place. Gacy's crimes escalated over time as he honed his predatory skills. He targeted vulnerable young men and boys, often often luring them with promises of employment or money. Once he had them under his control, he would trap them in his ranch house, where unspeakable horrors awaited. Rape, torture, and murder became Gacy's twisted routine. He buried 26 of his victims in the crawl space beneath his home, while four others met their fate in the depths of the Desplaines River. The sheer brutality and sadistic nature of his crimes were beyond comprehension. The turning point came in December 1978, when a teenager named Robert Peast went missing. Peast was last seen at a pharmacy, where Gacy had been discussing a potential remodeling deal. His disappearance sparked a massive search effort and put Gacy under intense scrutiny. It was during this investigation that the police uncovered crucial evidence linking Gacy to the disappearance of multiple young men and boys. They discovered that Gacy often hired teenage boys for his construction business, offering them a starting wage that was almost double what they were earning elsewhere. As the investigation intensified, law enforcement staked out Gacy's residence, hoping to gather enough evidence to make an arrest. In April 1978, one of Gacy's surviving victims, Jeffrey Rignall, provided crucial information that led the police to Gacy's house at 8,213 West Summerdale. On July 15, 1978, the relentless pursuit finally came to an end. Gacy was arrested and charged with assault and battery against Rignall, but little did anyone know that this was just the tip of the iceberg. As investigators delved deeper into Gacy's twisted world, they discovered a horrifying truth. The crawl space beneath his home became a graveyard, with the remains of 26 victims buried there. Autopsies revealed the gruesome some details of their deaths, confirming the unimaginable horrors they had endured. The identification of Gacy's victims was a painstaking process, requiring the collaboration of law enforcement, forensic experts, and the families of the missing. Dental records, x-rays, and personal artifacts were used to bring closure to the families and provide a sense of justice for the victims. In 1980, Gacy stood trial for his heinous crimes. The evidence presented was overwhelming, and the jury had no choice but to deliver a guilty verdict. Gacy was convicted of 33 murders and sentenced to death. On May 10, 1994, justice was finally served. John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection, bringing an end to one of the most horrifying chapters in American criminal history. The investigation into Gacy's crimes not only brought closure to the families of the victims, but also raised questions about the possibility of accomplices and the existence of additional unidentified victims. The FBI's relentless pursuit of the truth ensured that no stone was left unturned. Throughout the investigation into John Wayne Gacy's heinous crimes, the FBI held tightly onto certain secrets secrets, concealed details that were kept hidden from the public eye. The FBI also developed psychological profiles of Gacy, delving into the depths of his twisted mind. These profiles provided valuable insights into his motives, behavior, and potential patterns. However, the details of these profiles were kept confidential during the trial, ensuring that the defense would not have access to this critical information. Specific crime scene details were also held back from the public. The precise locations where the bodies were found, the condition in which they were discovered, and any additional additional evidence that could potentially compromise the investigation were all kept confidential. This ensured that the prosecution had a strong case against Gacy without revealing crucial information that could be exploited by the defense. By keeping these secrets hidden, the FBI aimed to protect the integrity of their investigation and ensure that justice would be served. They understood the importance of maintaining the element of surprise and preserving the strength of their case against Gacy. The identification process of Gacy's victims has been a painstaking and collaborative effort involving law enforcement agencies forensic experts, and the families of the missing. Through DNA testing, dental records, and facial reconstructions, the identities of some victims have finally been revealed. Of the 33 victims Gacy was convicted of murdering, only 28 have been conclusively identified. The youngest victims were Samuel Stapleton and Michael Marino, both 14 years old, while the eldest were Francis Alexander and Russell Nelson, both 21 years old. The recovery of the victims' bodies from various locations, including the crawl space beneath Gacy's home, the garage, the dining room, and the Des Plaines River, 
provided crucial evidence for their identification. Autopsies revealed the causes of death, ranging from asphyxiation and strangulation to suffocation. Five victims still remain unidentified, their names and stories waiting to be discovered. Efforts continue to identify them through ongoing DNA testing and facial reconstructions as technology advances and new leads emerge. Jeffrey Dahmer Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. From an early age, Dahmer displayed troubling behavior that hinted at the darkness that lay within him. As a child, Dahmer was known to dissect animals, showing a morbid curiosity about their inner workings. This fascination with death and dissection would later manifest in his gruesome crimes. Dahmer's teenage years were marked by a growing sense of isolation and a deepening obsession with death. He struggled with feelings of inadequacy and a lack of social connection. In high school, Dahmer was described as a loner, often retreating into his own world. He had few friends and struggled to fit in with his peers. Dahmer's parents, Lionel and Joyce, noticed their son's increasingly strange behavior but were unaware of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface. Lionel, a chemist, and Joyce, a teletype machine instructor, tried their best to provide a stable home environment for their troubled son. However, they were unaware of the depths of his inner turmoil. During his high school years, Dahmer's fascination with death and dissection intensified. He began collecting roadkill and preserving the bone of animals he found. After graduating from high school in 1978, Dahmer's life took a dark turn. He enrolled at Ohio State University but dropped out after just one semester. Dahmer's time at college was marked by heavy drinking and a growing sense of alienation. He struggled academically and socially, feeling like an outcast among his peers. In 1982, Dahmer returned to Milwaukee, where he would eventually commit his heinous crimes. He found employment at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, but was fired due to his excessive drinking on the job. By the late 1980s, Dahmer had established a sinister routine that would lead to the demise of many young men. He would prowl the streets of Milwaukee, searching for his victims. Dahmer targeted vulnerable individuals, often young men from marginalized communities. He would approach them with promises of money or alcohol, exploiting their desperation and need for companionship. Once Dahmer had lured his victims to his apartment, he would drug them, rendering them unconscious and defenseless. Dahmer used a variety of substances, including sedatives and alcohol, to incapacitate his victims. This ensured that they would be unable to resist his sadistic desire. Desires. Inside his apartment, Dharma's true nature was revealed. He would carry out acts of unspeakable horror, fulfilling his twisted fantasies. Dharma's crimes involved extreme violence, including strangulation and dismemberment. He would often engage in acts of necrophilia and cannibalism, indulging in the most depraved desires imaginable. Dharma's apartment became a macabre shrine to his victims. He would meticulously preserve body parts, keeping them as trophies or for later consumption. The extent of Dharma's depravity was beyond comprehension. His actions shocked even seasoned investigators. The FBI, along with local law enforcement, began to piece together the horrifying truth. The remains of Dahmer's victims were found hidden throughout his apartment. Photographs and other evidence revealed the full extent of Dahmer's sadistic acts. The sheer brutality and disregard for human life were chilling. In July 1991, Dahmer's reign of terror came to an end. One of his intended victims, Tracy Edwards, managed to escape and flagged down two police officers. Edwards led the officers back to Dahmer's apartment, where they discovered the horrors that lay within. The FBI found and meticulously catalogued the evidence, documenting the chilling details of Dharma's cannibalistic acts. The FBI, in an effort to protect the families of the victims and shield the public from further trauma, made the decision to keep some of the most disturbing details hidden from the public eye. These hidden secrets, known only to a select few, reveal the depths of Dharma's descent into darkness. Dharma was arrested and charged with multiple counts of murder. The shocking details of his crimes sent shockwaves through the community and captivated the nation. During his trial, Dharma pleaded guilty guilty but insane, attempting to use his mental disorders as a defense. However, the prosecution argued that he was fully aware of his actions and sought to avoid detection. The jury ultimately found Dharma to be legally sane, convicting him on all counts. He was sentenced to multiple life terms in prison. In a shocking turn of events, the families of Dharma's victims were awarded his estate. However, this decision sparked controversy and outrage. Some argued that the estate should be destroyed, erasing any trace of Dharma's existence. Others believed that the proceeds from the estate should go towards supporting the victims' families. Ultimately, the decision was made to auction off Dharma's possessions. This decision further fueled the public's morbid fascination with the killer. Collectors and true crime enthusiasts eagerly bid on items that once belonged to Dharma, perpetuating the dark legacy of his crimes. While in prison, Dharma's life took a dramatic turn. He became a born-again Christian and expressed remorse for his heinous crimes. However, his time behind bars was short-lived. In 1994, Dharma was attacked and killed by a fellow inmate. The news of Dharma's demise brought mixed reactions from the public. Public. Some celebrated the end of his reign of terror, while others felt sadness for the families of his victims. Dennis Lynn Raider
Born on March 9, 1945, in Pittsburgh, Kansas, he grew up in Wichita, where he felt ignored by his parents. This sense of neglect may have contributed to the development of his sadistic sexual fantasies and his need for power and control. From a young age, Raider exhibited disturbing behavior, engaging in zoosadism, the torture and killing of small animals. This early display of violence and cruelty foreshadowed the horrors he would later inflict on his human victims. Raider also engaged in voyeurism, auto-erotic asphyxiation, and cross-dressing, further revealing Feeling the depths of his deviant desires. As an adult, Raider held various jobs, including working as an assembler and a security alarm installer. He appeared to be a normal, law-abiding citizen, actively participating in his church and community. This facade of normalcy allowed him to blend in seamlessly, making it even more difficult for law enforcement to identify him as the BTK killer. Dennis Lynn Raider operated in Wichita and Park City, Kansas, between 1974 and 1991. His reign of terror spanned over three decades, leaving the community in a constant state of fear and panic. Raider's victims were primarily women, whom he targeted with meticulous planning and sadistic intent. But what led Raider to target women and commit such acts of violence? The answer lies in his need for power and control. By binding and suffocating his victims, Raider exerted complete dominance over them, deriving sadistic pleasure from their suffering. The stolen keepsakes served as twisted mementos, reminders of his power and the lives he had taken. Raider's need for attention and recognition also played a significant role in his crimes. By leaving clues and taunting letters for the police and media, he sought to elevate his status and instill fear in the community. The moniker BTK became synonymous with terror, a name that struck fear into the hearts of those who heard it. It all began on January 15, 1974, when he committed his first confirmed murders. The Otero family, consisting of Joseph, Julie, Josephine, and Joseph Jr., fell victim to Raider's twisted desires. The family was brutally murdered in their own home, their lives cut short by an unknown monster. Raider's next victim was Catherine Brown who was attacked on April 4, 1974. Although she managed to fight back, Raider overpowered her and left her for dead. Miraculously, Catherine survived the attack and provided crucial information to the authorities, giving them their first glimpse into the mind of the BTK killer. But it wasn't until March 17, 1977, that Raider began leaving clues related to his murders for the police and reporters to find. A note was discovered in an engineering textbook at the Wichita Public Library. This note, signed with the chilling moniker BTK, referred to Raider as a monster and marked the beginning of his twisted game with law enforcement and the media. In 1978, after the murder of Shirley Vian, Raider escalated his taunting by leaving a poem that sent shockwaves through the community. The poem, titled Oh Death to Nancy, revealed the sadistic pleasure Raider derived from his heinous acts. It was a chilling reminder that the BTK killer was still at large, lurking in the shadows and ready to strike again. Raider's reign of terror continued throughout the 1980s. Each victim fell prey to Raider's meticulous planning and brutal methods. He would bind and suffocate them, leaving behind a trail of fear and devastation. After years of terrorizing the community, the BTK killer's reign of terror came to an end in 1991. Raider's last known murder occurred on January 19, 1991, when he targeted Dolores Davis. However, it would be over a decade before he resurfaced, reigniting the public's fascination with the elusive killer. In 2004, Raider began dropping clues again, more than 10 years after his last known murder. 30 years after Raider took the lives of his first victims, he sent a box to a local news channel in Wichita. Inside the box was a Barbie doll, eerily arranged to depict the murders he had committed. Alongside the doll was the driver's license of one of his victims, a haunting reminder of the lives he had taken. One month later, the same news station received a postcard from Raider, posing a question that would ultimately lead to his downfall. The postcard asked, Can I communicate with floppy disk and not be traced to a computer? Be honest. Raider, in his arrogance, sent the floppy disk, unaware that it contained metadata that would ultimately reveal his identity as the BTK killer. Law enforcement officials were able to trace the floppy disk back to Raider, leading to his arrest on February 25, 2005. The BTK killer, who had eluded capture for over three decades, was finally in custody. The news sent shockwaves through the community as the true extent of Raider's crimes was revealed. During his trial, Raider pleaded guilty to 10 counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, ensuring that he would never walk free again. The courtroom was filled with a mix of relief and grief as the families of Raider's victims finally saw justice served. But the impact of Raider's crimes extended far beyond the courtroom. The community of Wichita was forever changed by the horrors they had endured. The fear and paranoia that gripped the city for over three decades left a lasting scar, a reminder of the evil that can lurk in the most unexpected places. Raider's wife was granted an emergency divorce after his arrest, severing all ties to the man she once knew. His daughter, the only one who has spoken publicly about her father's dark past, has had to come to terms with the unimaginable horrors committed
affected by the man she once called Dad. The ripple effects of Raider's crimes continue to be felt by those who were touched by his reign of terror. Richard Ramirez Before Richard Ramirez became the infamous Night Stalker, his life was marked by a troubled childhood and a fascination with the macabre. Born on February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas, Ramirez's early years were far from ordinary. Ramirez grew up in a broken home, surrounded by violence and abuse. His father was known for his physical abuse, creating a hostile environment for young Richard. But it was his older cousin, Miguel Ramirez, who introduced him to a world of darkness. Miguel, a Vietnam veteran, often boasted about his crimes committed during the war. He even showed Richard a disturbing photo of himself, posing with the severed head of a Vietnamese woman he had abused. This exposure to violence and brutality at such a young age had a profound impact on Richard's psyche. Tragedy struck when Richard was just 13 years old. He witnessed Miguel shoot and kill his own wife, Jessie, during a heated argument. Miguel was later found not guilty by reason of insanity and released just four years later. This traumatic event further fueled Richard's fascination with death and violence. In 1982, at the age of 22, Ramirez made a fateful move from Texas to California. It was here that his crimes would begin, although authorities believe he may have started even earlier than they initially thought. Ramirez's dark interests extended beyond his troubled childhood. He developed a deep fascination with Satanism and the occult, delving into the realms of the supernatural and the macabre. This fascination would later manifest itself in his crimes, as he sought to embody the embodiment of evil itself. Additionally, Ramirez's move to California introduced him to a new world of drugs, particularly cocaine. He became heavily involved in substance abuse, further fueling his violent tendencies and contributing to his descent into darkness. As Ramirez's fascination with the macabre grew, so did his desire to act out his darkest fantasies. Little did anyone know that this troubled young man would soon embark on a reign of terror that would grip California in fear. In the summer of 1984, Ramirez embarked on a chilling crime spree that would spread fear throughout Greater Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. Ramirez's crimes were characterized by extreme violence and sadism. He would break into his victim's home often under the cover of darkness, and attack them while they slept. No one was safe from his wrath. Ramirez used a variety of weapons to inflict harm on his victims, including handguns, knives, a machete, a tire iron, and even a claw hammer. His victims were subjected to brutal beatings, strangulation, and sexual assault. The level of cruelty displayed in his crimes was unimaginable. What made Ramirez's crimes even more terrifying was their seemingly random nature. He targeted both men and women of various ages, leaving the community in a constant state of fear and paranoia. The media coverage of Ramirez's crimes only heightened the public's fear. His acts were sensationalized and widely reported, creating a climate of panic and unease. People were terrified to sleep at night, and many took extra precautions to secure their homes. The Night Stalker's reign of terror coincided with a delicate time for Los Angeles. The city was hosting the 1984 Summer Olympics, a time of celebration and international attention. But Ramirez's crimes cast a dark shadow over the festivities. The Los Angeles Lakers, in the midst of their legendary Showtime era, were were also vying for an NBA championship, but the city's celebratory mood was dampened by the fear and uncertainty caused by the Night Stalker. The timing of Ramirez's reign of terror couldn't have been worse. Just eight years earlier, Los Angeles had experienced the horrors of another serial killer known as the Hillside Strangler. But amidst the chaos and fear, the authorities were determined to bring Ramirez to justice. They tirelessly searched for clues and connections that would lead them to the elusive Night Stalker. One crucial breakthrough came in the form of shoe print evidence. During the investigation of the Whittier murder, Murders, police discovered a shoe, print from a men's avia sneaker, providing a vital clue to the identity of the Night Stalker. The shoe print, along with other evidence, helped investigators piece together the puzzle and narrow down their search for Ramirez. But the Night Stalker remained one step ahead, leaving a trail of terror in his wake. The breakthrough in the hunt for the Night Stalker came on August 31, 1985, in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. Ramirez had attempted to steal a car, but his plans were foiled when a group of residents recognized him and chased him down. The residents, fueled by by a mix of fear and determination, managed to catch Ramirez and hold him until the police arrived. The capture of the Night Stalker was a moment of triumph for the community and a relief for the entire state of California. With Ramirez in custody, the authorities began the painstaking process of building a case against him. The evidence against the Night Stalker was overwhelming, linking him to a series of murders, sexual assaults, and burglaries. In 1989, Richard Ramirez stood trial for his heinous crimes. The courtroom was filled with tension and anticipation as the prosecution presented a mountain of evidence. 
evidence, including DNA, fingerprints, and eyewitness testimonies. The trial revealed the true extent of Ramirez's depravity. He was convicted of 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. The sheer number and brutality of his crimes shocked the nation. The jury's verdict was swift and decisive. Richard Ramirez was sentenced to death, a punishment that reflected the severity of his crimes and the pain he had inflicted on his victims and their families. While on death row, Ramirez received numerous letters from fans who were inexplicably drawn to his dark persona. He even got married to a woman who believed in his innocence, showcasing the disturbing fascination some individuals had with his crimes. However, DNA evidence would later link Ramirez to additional crimes, including the rape and murder of a nine-year-old girl. His appeals for a new trial were ultimately unsuccessful, and he spent years on death row at San Quentin State Prison. In 2013, Richard Ramirez's reign of terror came to an end, not through execution, but through complications of B-cell lymphoma. He died in prison, leaving behind a legacy of fear and a chilling reminder of the horrors that can be perpetrated by a serial killer. Gary Leon Ridgeway Gary Leon Ridgway, the man who would later become known as the Green River Killer, was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Growing up, Ridgway had a troubled childhood, marked by a tumultuous relationship with his parents and a difficult time fitting in at school. As a young boy, Ridgway exhibited disturbing behavior, including cruelty towards animals and a fascination with death. These early signs of a disturbed mind would later manifest in his horrific crimes. Ridgway's troubled upbringing continued into his teenage years. He struggled academically and dropped out of high school in the 10th grade. With limited prospects, he took on various odd jobs, including working as a truck painter at Kenworth Truck Company. It was during this time that Ridgway's dark desires began to take hold. He started frequenting the areas around the Green River, where he would later dump the bodies of his victims. The vulnerable women who worked as sex workers in the area became his targets. The FBI has kept a close eye on Ridgway since 1982, suspecting his involvement in the string of murders. However, it would take nearly two decades before advances in DNA profiling technology would definitively link him to the crimes. For nearly two decades, Gary Leon Ridgway unleashed a reign of terror upon the Pacific Northwest, targeting vulnerable women and sex workers. His crimes were heinous and brutal, leaving a trail of victims in his wake. Ridgway's modus operandi was chillingly consistent. He would approach his victims, often offering them money or promising them work. Once he gained their trust, he would lure them to secluded areas, where he would strangle them to death using ligatures. Ridgway's preferred dumping grounds were the forested areas in King County, Washington, particularly near the Green River. What made Ridgway's crimes even more disturbing was his penchant for returning to the bodies of his victims. He would engage in sexual acts with the deceased, further demonstrating the depths of his depravity. The FBI had long suspected Ridgway's involvement in the murders, but it wasn't until advances in DNA profiling technology that they were able to definitively connect him to the crimes. In 2001, Ridgway was finally arrested and brought to justice. During his trial, Ridgway shocked the world with his chilling confession. He admitted to the murders of 48 women, making him one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. As part of a plea bargain, he disclosed the locations of still missing women, providing closure to their families. The Green River Killer case stands as a stark reminder of the horrors that can be perpetrated by a single individual. Ridgway's reign of terror left a lasting impact on the Pacific Northwest community and forever changed the lives of the victims' families. While the arrest and conviction of Gary Leon Ridgway brought some closure to the victims' families, there are shocking secrets that the FBI has kept hidden from the public. These secrets shed light on the investigative failures and missed opportunities that allowed Ridgway to continue his killing spree for so long. One of the most startling revelations is the overlooked evidence by the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory. Microscopic paint spheres, unique to a specific industrial spray paint, were found on the clothing of Ridgway's first victim and several others. These spheres could have been detected back in the 1980s, potentially preventing some of the 49 confirmed killings. The evidence was linked to Ridgway's workplace, Kenworth Truck Company, where he used the same spray paint on a daily basis. The failure of the crime lab to identify these paint spheres was a grave oversight. Even the investigators assigned to the case were unaware of this crucial evidence. Trace evidence expert Skip Palahniuk, who was brought in to assist with the investigation, revealed that he could have identified the paint spheres back in the 1980s if given the opportunity. However, the lab director never reached out to him. Another shocking secret is the FBI's rejection of a request to compare hairs collected from Ridgway to those recovered from the victims in the 1990s. The lab had already spent years analyzing hairs and fibers 
was without success and deemed the request pointless. This rejection further delayed the identification of the killer. It wasn't until advancements in DNA science in the early 2000s that the crime lab was finally able to match DNA from Ridgway's saliva to sperm recovered from victims. This breakthrough led to his arrest and subsequent confession. However, it raises questions about why the analysis of DNA evidence wasn't prioritized earlier. The revelation of these overlooked pieces of evidence and missed opportunities has left the families of the victims and the public outraged. The FBI's secrecy surrounding these revelations raises concerns about their handling of the case and their commitment to justice. The FBI's continued secrecy is founded upon their need to ensure that investigations are interfered with by the public as well as said serial killers. With this policy, the Bureau has been able to rid the world of these killers who have no respect for humanity. Check out this next video to learn more about unconventional methods the FBI uses in its investigations.